If you've written any Gleam, you probably know that Gleam doesn't compile to binary like a lot of modern languages. Instead, Gleam actually has two compilation targets, JavaScript and Erlang. Each has different uses. You'd typically use the JavaScript target if you're doing some front-end work using a framework like Luster, or you compile to Erlang to create super scalable, fault-tolerant back-end services. But you may be thinking, how does Gleam manage to work across both Erlang and JS? For example, how come we can access built-in functions like Erlang's display play or JavaScript's console.log. That's thanks to Gleam's excellent support for foreign function interfaces, or FFIs. An FFI is just a way for a programming language to call functions written in another one. In Gleam's case, the compiler can substitute the correct function based on your compilation target. FFIs aren't limited to the standard library though. You can actually write your own. And in this video, we're going to explore how you might do that, why you'd want to, and some common pitfalls when creating foreign functions. Ready to get Gleamy? Before we get started, it's worth noting that Gleam's documentation refers to FFIs as external functions, i.e. they're external to Gleam. However, I'll be using the FFI terminology throughout this video to be more in line with what you might see in other programming languages. There's actually nothing special you need to do to start using FFI in your Gleam project. FFIs are built into Gleam natively, so you don't need to install any special packages or do any extra setup step. You don't even have to use a compiler flag. It all just works. And of course, because Gleam's philosophy is to make things simple, calling out to Erlang or JavaScript is really easy. All you have to do is provide a function signature, then decorate it with the at external annotation. This takes three arguments. The first argument is the language you'd like to target. At the time of recording, this is either JavaScript or Erlang. The second argument is the path to the JavaScript or Erlang source file that contains the function you'd like to call. And the last argument is the name of that function. One thing to be wary of is that the compiler can't infer the parameter or return type to the foreign function you're trying to call, so make sure to get those right. We'll get into how Gleam values are represented in each of the target languages shortly. If you don't need access to the values internals from Gleam for whatever reason, you can create a Gleam type with no constructor and use that in your foreign function interface. For example, this function returns a JavaScript date, and this function takes one as an argument, but we don't actually need to inspect the value using Gleam at all. I can just pass it around like any other value, and it'll work as expected. You can get a string representation of the value using string.inspect or print out the value using io.debug and you'll see that it's prefixed by the name of the target. This makes sure you don't mix up Gleam and non-Gleam values. Of course, an FFI doesn't just have to have a single target. If you're writing a library for others to use, it's common to want to support both JavaScript and Erlang. In this case, you can use multiple external annotations to provide implementations for both targets. In fact, this is what a lot of the standard library does. For example, the io.printline function calls this internal do printline function, which is ultimately just an FFI to Erlang's io.putcars and JavaScript's console.log. If you only provide one annotation and try compiling for the other target, you'll get an error at compile time. But what if you want to use a foreign function for one target, but a Gleam implementation for the other? Well, you can absolutely do that. This comes in handy when you have a function that can be implemented in Gleam, but one of the target runtimes has a more efficient implementation you can use instead. Both Erlang and JavaScript have have some standard library functions that are written in optimized C or C++ respectively, so it can be worth tapping into those if they suit your use case. All you have to do is provide a body for a function marked with external. In this example, the reverse list function will use the Gleam implementation when compiling to JavaScript, but it'll use the lists reverse function from the Erlang standard library when you're targeting Erlang. If you're curious how this works, essentially when there's a foreign implementation available, the Gleam compiler will substitute any calls to the Gleam function with the foreign function. And if there aren't any available, it'll create the defined function as it would any other function and call it normally. For example, in the main function for the above, the generated JavaScript code will call the reverse list function, while any calls to reverse list will be substituted for list reverse on Erlang. Like I mentioned earlier, it's fairly simple. But how are types translated across the boundary between Gleam and its targets? Well, this varies depending on where you're compiling to. Let's start with Erlang. In the case of primitive types, you get pretty much what you'd expect. The Gleam primitives mostly map one-to-one -one with the Erlang ones. Ints map to ints, floats to floats, balls to balls. Since Erlang doesn't have a string type, Gleam strings are represented as UTF-8 bit arrays. The only other exception is nil, which just becomes an Erlang atom called nil. As for container types, again, things are pretty much just a one-to-one -one mapping. Lists, tuples, and bit arrays all have exact representations in Erlang. When it comes to record types, like the built-in result type or any custom-defined record type, 
types, things are a little different. Since Erlang doesn't have an exact analogue for these, Gleam will use tuples instead. The first element of the tuple will be an Erlang atom representing the snake cased name of the record constructor, and the remaining elements will be the contained values. For example, an OK with the int 17 would become the tuple OK 17, and this custom Pokemon type would become a tuple of Pikachu, 55, and an empty list. This makes it super simple to use your Gleam record types in Erlang. You can easily pattern match on them, deconstruct them, and return them from your functions without breaking a sweat. And if this video is making you thirsty for more Gleam, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the bell below. I've got a lot of exciting stuff in the pipeline that you do not want to miss. In terms of using your own Erlang modules in Gleam, there are a few requirements. Firstly, the module must be placed in the root of the source directory, though, at the time of recording, there's an open issue to change this. Any functions you want to use in Gleam must be exported from the module. When setting up the FFI, the path argument is just the name of the Erlang module. So that's all for the Erlang target. But what about JavaScript? Well, JS is a little different for a few reasons. The biggest ones are JavaScript's dynamic type system and the fact that its values are often mutable. There are a couple of challenges that come with this and we'll get into them shortly. But right now, let's talk types. In most cases, JavaScript primitives are going to map roughly to Gleam's own. Balls are balls, strings are strings, and nil maps to undefined. Numbers are a bit of a special case. Since JavaScript doesn't have separate int and float types, both Gleam types just map to the number type in JS land. Because of this, when you're writing JS and returning numbers from your FFI functions, be extra careful you're returning correctly. If you're returning an int, it's probably best to use one of the rounding functions from JavaScript's standard library. Gleam's lists just map directly to JavaScript arrays. However, JavaScript arrays are heterogeneous and contain multiple types, whereas Gleam's lists can't. So you'll need to be careful to make sure lists always contain values of the same type, since JavaScript can't make these guarantees for you. JavaScript is also lacking a tuple type. Gleam tuples will just compile to JS arrays. So again, you'll need to be careful that you've got the right types, but you'll also need to make sure that you return arrays of the correct length when going from JS to Gleam. Going back to the reverse example from earlier, you might have wondered why we didn't use JavaScript's array.prototype.reverse. Firstly, this is a method, so we can't use it directly. We could have created a wrapper function, but there's another problem here. Crucially, this method reverses in place, which would break Gleam's immutability guarantees. Since JavaScript doesn't enforce immutability like Gleam does, it's important not to modify values in your foreign functions. Users in Gleamland would rightfully expect immutability, and it could go badly if their memory started changing out from underneath them. Record types need some special treatment too. When targeting JavaScript, Gleam compiles your custom record types to JS class. You can import these from within your JS modules and construct them like you would any other class. If you need to return a result type, you can import the OK and error constructors from dot slash gleam dot MJS, which is where the Gleam globals live. You can also check for specific variants using regular instance of checks. Using your JS modules in an external annotation is easy. The path argument just becomes the path to the JS file containing your foreign functions. This currently has to live in the source directory, but the path is relative to the file in which the foreign function interface is defined, and make sure you export any functions you'd like to use from Gleam. You might be tempted to use FFI everywhere, especially if you're more familiar with Erlang or JS than you are with Gleam. But of course, this isn't really recommended. Generally, you should only use FFI in a few specific scenarios. The first is if you need to access functions built into the target runtime. For example, in JavaScript, you may need access to Node or browser APIs, whereas those using Erlang might want to bind to OTP functions. You can see good examples of these in the Gleam Erlang and Gleam JavaScript libraries. Another good example for JavaScript FFI is Plint by Crowdhaler, a collection of bindings for various JavaScript runtimes. The second situation is when the underlying platform has a more efficient implementation than you can write yourself in Gleam, like the reverse example we showed earlier. Your target platform will probably have some functions written in C or C++, and when you need performance, it can be really beneficial to use them. It's usually a good idea to keep your foreign functions fairly small where you can. If possible, you should try to use them to complete a single action or create a single value. Writing long functions in multiple languages is just going to make things really hard to debug. And in the JavaScript case in particular, you're likely to get caught up in all sorts of problems with mutability. Basically, write Gleam for most things and only reach for FFI if you really need to, and then only sparingly. FFI opens up a whole host of possibilities when you're writing Gleam. What will you use it for? Let me know down in the comments below. And if you want to see how you can use someone else's FFIs to create beautiful beautiful front-end apps in Gleam, click the video on the left. Or, if you fancy leaving your fate in YouTube's hands, you might want to try the one on the right. See ya!